Father, we know that you honor your word and that you just really want to know us and for us to know you more. So, Lord, we thank you for all that you say and you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're in Genesis chapter 15. Come on in, brother. What's that? I said that the amen corner. Oh, all right. I can use that. We're going to talk about the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant consists of land, seed, and blessing. In Genesis chapter 3, we saw the curse was announced, and we also saw the first prophecy of Christ being given to Adam and Eve. In that, we saw that God promised a seed was going to come from the woman. And that seed would crush the head of the serpent. Now we see God's focus is narrowing down to this one man, Abraham. That through Abraham, the promise would come. That's what we're talking about, land, seed, and blessing. The land is the land of Israel. Irregardless of what you read and see on the news, the land of Israel, the title deed, is in the book of Genesis. And the one that could truly give that title deed to somebody is God. And when we get into this, you're going to be surprised about how big that land and that promised title deed is. Because it isn't just this little sliver of land that the nation of Israel occupies today. In truth, the title deed to Israel goes from the Nile to the river Euphrates, encompassing all of Saudi Arabia, the Sinai Peninsula, nearly all of the Middle East, half of Iraq, all of Syria, and Lebanon. That's a huge chunk of land. So when people talk about the Palestinian issue, people really should do a little bit more homework on their history. Because the reason why the land was called Palestine was in 70 AD when the Romans conquered Jerusalem, they wanted to insult the Jews. And the one thing that they could do to insult the Jews more than anything is to rename the land the land of the Philistines. You see, Palestine, or Palestinian, is a derivative of the word Philistine. Just remember that. And you'd be also, just, you'd be also surprised about how many times that Jewish people went to the land of Israel and purchased land from the Palestinians, and yet it's reported that they stole it. Guys, one thing we know about our media is they lie. Okay? Do not think what you see on the 6 o'clock news is the truth. And you don't have to overtly lie. You can just leave something out. You know? And oftentimes that's how it's done. They tell you half of the story. So just reframe your thinking when you're thinking about the land of Israel. <laughs> reframe your thinking when you're thinking about the children of Abraham. There's also people out there that believe that you have to go through some rituals and stuff to satisfy God. But the Bible's very clear about the fact that these promises were given to Abraham before he went through the ritual of circumcision. They were given to Abraham before the law was delivered. Let's, uh, in Titus chapter 2, I mean, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, sorry. For this reason I also suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Paul is stating that it is not his responsibility to keep his salvation secure. Chapter 15 here deals with God making a covenant with Abram. He's not Abraham yet, but he is having a covenant made with, between him and God for land, seed, and blessing. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, it says, Who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. In the old King James, it uses the word ernst. 
Anybody that's ever bought a house has had to put earnest money down. God has given you the Holy Spirit as earnest money for your salvation, to testify within you of your salvation, to bring you along, to help you become sanctified. Sanctification is just being brought up into maturity spiritually into Jesus Christ. When you're saved, you're justified. And when we leave this world, either through rapture or death, one of the two, at that point in time, we will be glorified. Okay? Understand this. We all sin. Till the day we're pulled out of this world, we all sin. That's why it's important what Paul said. I know to whom I have entrusted this who can keep it until the day of judgment. He's telling us that we can trust Him. If we've trusted in Christ for our salvation, we can trust Him to keep it. Even though we've bungled it time and time again, and we have to go to Christ again and again and again and confess our sins, Christ is always willing and able to forgive us our sins. 1 John 1.9 says, If we would confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to cleanse us from our sins and all unrighteousness. You know, to me, that is incredible. Because I have tried to... Have you ever tried to live as a Christian? It's an impossible deal. Anybody says, well, I'm trying to be a good Christian. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> All right? You know what I try and do now? I try and give it to God every single day. Because... It's only through His Spirit that we're sanctified. And I've got several other supporting verses for this, but the basic truth of it is this, is we entrust our souls to Jesus Christ through His shed blood, that He's paid the price for our sins, and we trust in Him for our salvation, not ourselves. And repentance is not what I, I struggled with the idea of repentance for years. I'm going to stop doing this. This bad habit that I've got in my life, I'm going to stop it. I'm going to tie my boots up tight and I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to do that. And every single time, the one thing I was trying not to do is the very thing I did again within five minutes. <laughs> it's only when we surrender to the Holy Spirit and to Christ in our life that true change can come in our life. True change, not false change. Try as you will. We are sinners at heart because we are sons and daughters of Adam. But when we become sons and daughters of God through Christ, He enables us through the Holy Spirit to change. Amen. Amen. He enables us to forgive. <clears throat> he enables us to grow up. And some people don't like that term when people say that to us. To grow up. But there's many in the church, myself included, that oftentimes we need to grow up and realize our pet projects are not God's. God's project is in the saving of souls through forgiveness of sins. That's what His project is. And it, it, it's not extended to a select group of people. It's extended to all mankind. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1. I'm Genesis 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. We see that God himself is Abraham's protect, protection and reward. Now, in Romans, it talks about the fact, in Romans chapter 8, if God be for us, who can be against us? We as Christians need to internalize that idea. That God is not so concerned with our comfort as He is with our maturity. There are some uncomfortable things Christians have got to go through in this lifetime. There are some very painful things Christians have gone through. But God has meant it for good for you. If you keep yourself in submission to Him, God will use it to grow you up into an image like His Son. 
You read Romans chapter 8. I would just encourage each and every one of you. I love that chapter. Anytime I feel like I'm being beaten up by the enemy or circumstances in my life, I go right to that chapter. It'll give you an attitude correction so quick. Verse 2 in chapter 15 of Genesis. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards the heaven, count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Seed. A promise of seed, a promise of descendants coming from him. God's promise. And that they will be beyond number. In Romans chapter 4, I'd encourage each and every one of you to read Romans chapter 4. Because Romans chapter 4 deals with this idea of salvation. It deals with the idea of what Abraham did in faith. I would read you the entire chapter, but we don't have time tonight. But the point is, it was before Abraham was circumcised that he was accounted as righteous because he believed in God. You see... The righteousness comes from God because we believe God. It doesn't come from us doing good deeds. It doesn't come from us being good or being saintly or doing some religious practice. It comes from belief. It comes from faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is very clear about this. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works, not of yourself, lest any should boast. It is a free gift of God. <clears throat> now think about this. If you went to heaven because in a split second you saved some guy from being run over by a bus, and then you get to heaven and you... You're having to room up with somebody that spent their whole life feeding orphans in India. And for all eternity, you listen to this person talk about how they're feeding orphans in India. Would that be heaven or hell? It would be hell. See, we stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. That's what this is about. It's about faith. It's not about works. And we'll see that further on down. Romans chapter 1, verse 6, 16 and 17 reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That is not a New Testament concept. That is a quotation from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4 where it says, Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. This is not an Old Testament idea. This is not a New Testament idea. This is a whole Testament idea. The whole Testament of God. We also can look to Hebrews chapter 11 for proof of salvation by faith. But it's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, which encourage us to press on, even when everyone and everything tells us to stop, that this is foolishness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, let us run it with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of, of our faith, for who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, Christ is our example. Just as Christ was an example to Abraham. Remember, Christ himself said, Abraham longed to see his day and did. Think about this. God gave Abraham a glimpse of the future, a glimpse of the salvation. 
Back in chapter 15 of Genesis, we see God starting, stating it was him who brought Abram out of Ur. And it was him who was giving Abram the promise, promised land. We also see God is not afraid or angry with honest questions. Abram, after all, is pushing 100. He asked the question, you know, you haven't given me kids. I'm nearly 100. What's going on here, God? So many times we think that we can't ask God questions. But we can. God can take it. Look at Job. Look at Job's railing against God. Now, I would like, not like to be rebuked like Job was rebuked. But the fact of the matter is God can take our questions. He wants a relationship with you. Ask God those questions. He's not going to shirk. He's not going to back away from them. Genesis 15, 7. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? God is not afraid of our concerns. He wants us to know, he wants to know them. He wants us to tell them. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Right there, we're being told that when we have concerns or we have questions, God wants to hear them. God is concerned with you. Now, take five seconds and think about your own children. How many times have you stopped everything you're doing to listen to your children about the concerns that are going on in their life? Everything, everything else can be put aside as your little child comes to you and expresses their concerns and their heartfelt needs. As a believer, we forget this often. We forget that God cares for us so deeply. Now God is about to prove to Abraham by literally signing on the bottom line of this covenant he's going to make with Abram. To certify to all creation the inheritance of Abram. This is where the term cut a contract or cut a covenant comes from. So he said to me, verse 9, So he said to me, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him, cut them in two down the middle, and placed, them, placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. The idea is that by making the sacrifice, the animals signify how serious the parties of this covenant are. Where, when they make this covenant, the two parties of the covenant walk in a figure eight between these cut pieces. And the idea being proposed here is that if I don't uphold my end of this bargain, let it be done to me what has been done to these animals, let I be cut in two. That's the idea. That's how serious this idea was. And wouldn't you know it, after Abraham gets the animals prepared, has them laid out, vultures come to profane the covenant. Unclean birds. Abraham, Abraham drives them off, off these unclean birds. You could say that they are a type of Satan trying to pollute God's covenant with his people. At some point you should study birds in the scriptures. It's a pretty amazing study. Verse 12, Now when the sun was going down, a deep, deep sleep fell upon Abraham. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a strange land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And all the nations whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Okay, hold on. A great sleep fell upon Abraham. And darkness... Doesn't this sound like the darkness that descended upon 
upon uh, Mount Sinai when God came down. You know, God's protecting Abram. No man has seen God at any time and lived. So God draws this veil between him and Abram. And this great, in this great sleep that fell upon him, that's, that's a kind of an interesting thing. We'll cover that in just a little bit. But the Lord has Abraham in a helpless state to protect him to, and to give him a prophecy of the captivity and the blessings that would be received from his children from Egypt. Now we don't think of the Egyptian captivity as a blessing. But we see one thing in here, in verse 16, that they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. We have no idea what would have been happened to the nation of Israel if they had stayed in the land. You know, we're talking about some pretty weird things going on in the land. We're talking about the Rephaim and some of these other descendants of, you know, the descendants of Anak. There was some evil stuff going on in the land. And when Joshua enters the land after the captivity and after the wilderness wanderings, Joshua is told to go to some of these tribes and wipe it completely out because they had become so evil. So we don't have any clue as to the protection that God had placed on them by doing this. But we do know that when they came out, that they were blessed with with riches and they were blessed with livestock. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. <coughs> this tells me that God did this for the nation Israel and he does this for us because he cares for us. Jeremiah 20:11 says, "For I know the thoughts that I think toward you," says the Lord, "thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope." You know, we can go through some pretty hard stuff. But the Lord takes us through that. You know, I'm sure that Noah, when he went into the ark with his family, and the lightning and the thunder and the waves were beating on the ark, that that whole thing was pretty scary, pretty upsetting, pretty nerve-wracking. But they trusted God by faith. We can go down through the whole annals of the Bible and all the different things that have happened over the years. Time and time again, God uses these stressful situations to grow His people up. To teach them to trust in Him. We may think this, these things are a curse, but oftentimes some of the things that I've gone through in my own life have been a blessing. I would never want to go through them again. And I'm sure there's some of you in here that would agree with me about things that have happened in your life. That you'd never want to go through them again. But those are what God used in your life to bring you to greater and greater maturity in Jesus Christ. Those are the times where you leaned on Christ the most, where you prayed harder, you sought His face, you fasted, you asked the questions you were afraid to ask before because all bets were off. And your relationship with your Lord grew. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. But notice back in Genesis chapter 15 verse 16, it states, For the... Oh, I just went over the same thing. 1 <laughs> Corinthians 15.33 Do not be deceived... Evil company corrupts good habits. Why don't I bring that up? So oftentimes, we try to reach out to people, and we should. But there's times where we are naive in the fact that we think, well, you know what, I'm going to go down to the bar and witness to somebody. And then pretty soon we're having beers, and pretty soon that becomes our hangout. Guys, we have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. There is test that comes to our lives, that God allows into our lives, and there is just sheer stupid mistakes we make. Do not blame the Lord for your stupid mistakes. Because I've made a ton of them. And I really wish I could say I haven't, but I have. 
But here's the point. If, if it's a stupid mistake or it's a test, he's there to hear what you're going through. He's there to help you. Just because you confess your sins, though, does not mean there won't be a scar. Right. Don't put self-inflicted wounds upon yourself. I'm just, in, I'm just asking you, as a brother in Christ, it's too easy to get sucked into things, thinking you're doing something good. Amen. Take your time. Pray about things. And take it one step at a time. Okay? 1 Corinthians, oh, wait a second, Ephesians 5 and 6, 5, 6, it says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. There's a lot of time the enemy uses something that sounds so good to us to trip us up. Because we are not prayerful. We don't seek the face of God. We don't fast and pray. Which is what we should do. We step out ahead of God. We get past the end of our skis, as some people would say. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extorters will inherit the kingdom of God. Why do I bring this up? Because in our culture, they're trying to play upon our emotions about being a good person is to accept this stuff. Yep. That is the very thing that I'm talking about, that somebody's camouflaging something that it's evil as good. Right. We live in a deceptive generation. Right. And we have been commanded by our Lord not to be deceived. Yes. Here's the hope. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. Guys, just because you've made mistakes doesn't mean you're irredeemable. There's only one unpardonable sin, and that's dying before you accept the free gift of salvation from Jesus Christ. That is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, because in Romans chapter 1, it clearly states that God testifies in the heart of all men who He is, and of salvation. And when you reject that, you're calling God a liar, and that's blasphemy. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When I was a kid, I thought the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was adultery. And talk about some bad theology that I had, <laughs> let me tell you. Okay? In our current society, people continue to try and force this stuff down our throats. But rest assured, your faith and your worth does not come from the society. It comes from God Himself and through His Word. That's why it's so important that you study this stuff. But as we go on down into verse 17 of chapter 15 of Genesis, we're going to see something that's just really amazing. Remember, Abraham's asleep. Okay, don't forget that. Abraham's asleep. And this big dark veil has been drawn across him. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch, that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made the covenant with Abraham, saying, Your descendants I will give the land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And that's the end of that chapter. But I've got a question for you. How did Abraham know this? How did Abraham know that this smoke and this smoking furnace, the smoking oven and this torch passed between the pieces? Because the word that is used in here is the word tamam terra, hold on, terra de ma. It's a Hebrew word meaning a trance light state. Think of a twilight state where you're falling asleep and you're in between asleep and awake. That is the closest thing that I can explain it to be. 
where you're aware of things that are going around you, but you know you're drifting off to sleep. I think God did that to protect, <coughs> to protect Abraham. <coughs> from what? From seeing, from seeing God's face, from seeing God himself. Um, guys, the good Lord, what does this say? See, Abraham didn't pass between the pieces, did he? They said that God passed between the pieces. The representation of God. So what does that mean to you and I? That means all of this, all of this guarantee is on God. Not on Abraham. And not on you and not on me. The only thing we have to do is believe. The work in our salvation is done by Christ. The work in these promises is done by God himself. So, what is, so how do we deal with this? How many of us have dr driven ourselves crazy and those around us crazy trying to keep all these religious traditions? Trying to do the right thing. You should try and do the right thing. But that your salvation is not a, built upon that. See, this takes the stress off your salvation. It also, actually, by taking the stress off of it, by taking the pressure off of it, it actually makes it easier to obey. When you realize that He loves you enough <clears throat> that it's not conditional upon your performance, then you want to obey. Then it kills you when you don't obey. Then your repentance is genuine and not forced and not some checklist. It becomes a real relationship. And as that happens, you start becoming sanctified. Your maturity levels go up in Christ. Your prayer life becomes real. You're not saying some canned prayer. You're talking to Christ as your loving Heavenly Father. You're talking to Him and knowing that He hears you and that He cares for you. And faith begets faith. <clears throat> and as you see things work out in your life and God providing for you and those around you in ways you'd never think about, your relationship grows and grows to the point you can't help but tell people about Christ and what He's done for you. I'm asking you as a brother, do not shortchange yourself. Build your relationship with your Father. Trust in Him. Seek His face. Through prayer. Through Bible study. Through coming together. It is so important that we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to build one another up, to edify each other, to lift one another up, to, to help educate each other about the scriptures and about what God says. In a loving way. Paul talks about speaking the truth in love. Paul was one of the, he was the most passionate, one of the most passionate men in the Bible. Now think about this. He says, I am the chief among sinners. He was so passionate to do the will of God, he was running around the countryside killing and torturing Christians because he believed that was the will of God. He was that passionate. And he was dispassionate about the people that he was doing that to. Until God knocked, knocked him off his horse and said, hey guy, <laughs> you're wrong. There's a lot of us in here that have had something similar. Maybe not a light shining from heaven, but circumstances in your life have brought you to that place. Or circumstances in your life right now have you right there. I would ask you, there is no longer coincidence in this life. There's only providence. Providence is God's provision for His believers. God is providing for you proof of his existence. God is providing for you a relationship. God is providing for you guidance in how to become a Christian, how to be a son or a daughter of the king. 
You are sons and daughters of the King. And He's calling you to a better way. And He's calling you to love one another. To forgive one another. Remember, Christ came not to establish religious doctrine, but to forgive and reconcile us to the Father. Romans 5 eight says, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, have you ever loved your enemy enough to take your child out, put a knife in the enemy's hand and say, Kill him and we'll be at peace. That's what your father did. That's what your Father in Heaven did by sending Christ to the earth. That might be shocking, and it should be shocking. But it's only through the shedding of blood that there is a remi there are remission of sins. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of, our, of sprinkling that speaks to better things than that of Abel. Remember Abel was killed by Cain? But Adam and Eve thought that the seed of God was come because when they had Seth, God, they said, God has appointed another. That's what Seth means. Appointed. So they believed that the promise of God was going to be answered in the first generation. And so they were looking towards the promise of God. But Abel, and you ought to read about Stephen's testimony in the book of Acts, when he talks about Abel. He, he puts him in there with the right, righteous prophets. But, the, but Jesus' payment was better than Abel's. In Jeremiah 31, 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. A new covenant. See, that's in the Old Testament. A new covenant. We're in the middle of the new covenant. Hebrews 6, chapter, 13, uh, chapter 6, verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by greater, and... An oath for confirmation is for them the end of, a dis end of a dispute. Thus, God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the mutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, the two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Immutable. It is not a word we use anymore in the English language. It means unchanging. It is impossible for this promise to change. It is impossible for God's promise to change towards you. See, people talk about, can somebody lose their salvation? And I have to say, I believe that somebody cannot lose their salvation. But the question is, are you saved? Or have you believed in vain? Have you not truly put your faith in Christ? And you think there's still some religious obligation you must fulfill? The sooner we realize this is by grace alone, through faith alone, the better off we are. And I love Christ for this. Because when I thought I was strongest in my faith is when I had my biggest downfall. When I thought I was, had this all sewed up, and I thought, well, look at me, look how religious I am. I fell flat on my face, and I let my family and myself be drugged through the dirt because I was weakest at my strongest point. That's where we're all at, every one of us, because we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. But Christ takes care of this for us through his shed blood on the cross. Have you really examined your heart? Have you really looked to Christ for your fulfillment? Do you have conversations with Him on a daily basis? Do you read His Word? Christ said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Right? 
just like your husband or your wife, if you love me, you'll do what I asked. I'll see it. Christ is saying the same thing. Put your money where your mouth is. If you love me, believe him. Because see, when we don't believe him, we call him a liar. When we don't believe that salvation is for us, and it's for somebody else, we're calling God a liar. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm trying to speak the truth and love to you guys. Because I love every one of you in Christ. And for years and years, I went through my life thinking I was a Christian. And I was a Sunday Christian. It means I'd show up on Sunday, and the rest of the week I'd drink and fight and whatever else. And then I'd go back to church on Sunday, and I was a good guy, because I put $20 in the offering plate, and I said my prayers. And so I was okay. God and I had an understanding. All right? But it was, it was hypocrisy. Total and complete hypocrisy. I thank God that I come to the end of myself and my wisdom was proved to be foolishness. So that the, wis the foolishness of God could be worked out in my life and salvation. I'd encourage you the same thing, but I'd take you back to one thing. And I know I'm ending short here, but guys, Paul says it best in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Amen. Now guys, I'm going to bring up one other thing too. Do not believe the lie that's being perpetrated out there in the media and in some religious publications that God has replaced the nation of Israel with the church. You guys, the answer to that and many other questions like that is found in the book of Romans. But specifically, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 addresses that question. God's not done with the nation of Israel. And time and time again, in the New Testament, it says to the Jew first and then also the Greek. And it also says that do not brag against the branches which have been cut off, you who have been grafted in, because the Lord can cut you off too. Think about that. Guys, it's, a, it's about faith. It was about faith for Abraham. It was about faith for Noah. It's about faith for Adam and Eve. It's about faith. Take God at His word. He wants to give you so much more. So many people hold their hand up and they resist God and they don't know they're resisting something that is probably the best thing that could ever happen to them. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this message tonight. Father, if there's anybody here that needs to seek your face and to repent, I just pray that you would give them the courage to do so. I pray for my brothers and sisters here tonight. I just pray that they would grow deeper in their knowledge of you and your word. I pray that you'd comfort anybody here that's going through a hard time in the realization that you will allow everything to come into our life for a reason. But Lord, it is your will that we look for. We know that you're a loving God. We know that you love us. But Father, you're also just. And we thank you for both of that because you could not love us and not be just at the same time. So Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.